questions Ladies and uh, gentlemen, welcome to the LSE for this evening's event. My name is George Gaskell, and amongst other things I do here at the school, I chair the management committee of LSE Entrepreneurship. We're delighted to be hosting uh, this event this evening and to be welcoming back to the London School of Economics, Sherry Kutu, principal author of the Scale Up Manifesto. And this is a major report commissioned by the UK government, which was published this week. It seeks to identify the actions that government, the corporate sector, universities, and entrepreneurs in the UK should consider taking to ensure high growth firms are scaling up successfully. Now, a word about LSE Entrepreneurship. It's a new unit in the school launched in October this year, and it was set up to promote uh, the potential of entrepreneurship for driving social change around the globe. Its activities help to shape the debate on entrepreneurship's impact on public policy and the thinking on entrepreneurship's potential to affect social change. We're achieving this through hosting events, courses that bring together different perspectives on the subject matter. This week, is Global Entrepreneurship Week, and this sees us host tonight's launch, as well as Nobel Laureate Professor Mohammed Yunus on Friday, highlighting the breadth, I think, of the way in which we are looking at entrepreneurship at the LSE. Next week, we also see the start of Entrepreneurship Matters, a new course with a lineup of speakers that includes founders of successful companies, policymakers, and experts in social entrepreneurship. One of the key goals of LSE Entrepreneurship is to understand how we can create an environment in which entrepreneurs thrive and new businesses develop, which is something uh, that the Scale-Up Manifesto speaks to. In a moment, I will welcome Sherry Kutu to the stage as well as being an alumna of the LSE. She's a leading entrepreneur, an expert on the impact of scale-ups in economic growth. She's uh, an NED on the London Stock Exchange, and has involvement with Cambridge University, Zoopla, and is an advisor to LinkedIn. Sherry is going to present the findings of the report, then we'll be inviting responses from three industry representatives, Andy Tong, Jeff Mulgan and Tamara Raja before opening up the floor to your questions. For those of you who are Twitter users, the hashtag for this event is hash scale up Britain, and I ask you to follow me in turning off your telephone. If my wife calls. Uh, so, power off. Now, I, uh, this evening's event is being recorded, and we would expect, subject to no technical difficulties, that the podcast will be available. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Sherry Kutu to the Right, can you, you can hear me. I think I can hear my voice reverberating around me, so that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, it is very, it's wonderful to be back here. Um, I was here in 1986, and um, having done my teenage, grown my teenage years in a, a lumber town in Canada, to come here to the LSE opened my eyes um, beyond my wildest dreams and, uh, and opened up paths to all sorts of things. And it was here that I first heard the word entrepreneur and it was first here that I was told that I was an entrepreneur and I've obviously been very obedient. Um, so <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for hosting. I can think of no better place to, um, to, to, to be tonight and to launch this and I'm very grateful for everything. 
Um, and I had a different, a different Twitter tag. I'm sorry about that. So I think there's somebody going to, but anyway, scale up, scale up, Britain, it all works. Um, so I wanted to thank yous, and I wanted to start with um, thanking um, this report. I was inspired by, it wasn't commissioned by George Osborne, but it was very much inspired by George Osborne, who wanted to turn the UK into the center of Europe. I've got an even bolder ambition to make it the center of the universe, um, but we can start with the center of Europe. Uh, and I very much do believe that it will bring new, new prosperity to the UK. Um, and I was also inspired by Reid Hoffman, who co-chairs uh, and was a founder of Silicon Valley it Comes to the UK with me, um, because he really goes on and on and on, and for years has gone on and on about, it's not about the idea, it's, about, it's not about the idea, the competitive advantage is from getting it to scale. Uh, and that inspired several sort of books and other lectures for the last two or three years about scaling up. I started in 2011 and 2012 publishing small booklets to entrepreneurs, telling them what they needed to do to scale up, because scaling up is really important. Um, it wasn't until recently that we sort of discovered, with the help of the people in the front row, how important it was to competitive advantage and how important it is to our nation. Uh, and I do think that it's absolutely clear now that competitive advantage of this country is dependent upon getting our companies that have been started up to scale up. Uh, and I look forward to working with uh, everybody in this room. And I hope that you said this, the entrepreneur, Entrepreneurship Matters course. You know, more power to it. I think it goes really well. Um, there's a lot of thank yous uh, for following, to the following individuals, the people on the team who really made this report come together. Um, this th this organization is here, seconded people from March to, to this uh, report and this endeavor to try to pull it together and make it happen. Uh, these companies I owe an apology to because I've sort of taken the leave of absence while well, a number of I've resigned to chairmanships of these three companies uh, and I've been sort of largely absent from all of these other companies for the last uh, six months while putting together this report and turning myself back into whatever, well, sort of an academic, I guess, for a little bit of time. Um, but it's, uh, it was very much a labor of love. Um, also, there were a large number of people involved in policy and business and academia from around the world that contributed to putting, putting this report together. And I'm very grateful for their guidance and I look forward to working with them um, going forward to see um, what else we need to do. So it all started here for me as an entrepreneur. Um, I was told I was an entrepreneur and I listened uh, and thought, well, maybe I should become a computer programmer first because I also discovered technology and how it could change the world when I was at the LSE because of some of the case studies that you were showing. Um, started up my first business in 91, joined my first startup in 94, founded the second startup in um, 95, sold the first one in 97, floated the second one in 2000, and then it all went horribly wrong. I got very busy. And I played around in a bunch of things, some finance, some culture, um, some human capital. I used to lecture at London Business School, and I do some stuff with Cambridge University and their finance committee, and I've joined some big companies as well. And all of those things that I've been involved with for the, since I was at the LSE have tempered my view and helped me think about entrepreneurship and particularly about scaling up companies. So what is a scale up? Um, we've got a very close definition of scale up. Uh, and it is, the reason we've defined it this way is, well, first of all, the OECD, it's the OECD definition, and they've, they've thought a lot about it. It's also the one used by uh, Nesta, I think, in their vital 6% report. It's also used by the ERC. Um, the best thing about it that I like is that it allows it to be measured and monitored. And if you can measure things and monitor things, then you can keep track of them and see how you're doing. Um, but it, what it talks about is an enterprise that has been growing for three years, so two periods, it's a trend, and it's growing at least at 20% per annum. And that growth can be in turnover or it can be in employees, um, and you start with those enterprises that have, <coughs> sorry, 10 employees uh, at least. And there's all sorts of reasons for that, but let's leave it as that, at that. Um, in the UK, there are 8,923 scale-ups, and they are roughly spread around the country. There are approximately 228 per local um, enterprise partnership, and three quarters of them are outside of London. So one of the other myths that you often hear is you hear a lot of talk about London all the time, but actually three quarters of our scale-ups in this country are not in London. They are all over the place. Um, I'm just going to point about the scale-ups as well. Some are between, you know, between 10 and 49, 50 to 250, and above 250 employees. Um, they can also be thought about in terms of bands 
of how fast they get their revenue up. So this is showing the, from the Cambridge map, and it shows that we've got 12 companies in holding that have more than 250 million in revenue. Um, we've got 15 that have more than 100 million in revenue, up from 12 last 12 months, yay. Um, above 50 million, we've got 19 that have gone up to 20, so that's good. Not so good on those that are above 25 million at the moment. I mean, someone sold out early. They sold out rather than going up. Oh. Um, anyway, um, here we've got one, one more at above 10 million, and we're doing pretty well at those that have just gone at above the 1 million. We obviously need to get lots more of these into this category. We need to get this category into this category, and so, and so on. Um, and if we do, it will be really, really good news for us and for them and for our children and for our grandchildren. Um, this is, I, lo I love this slide. Um, we hear about entrepreneurship being great, and it is great. Um, the top line are the number of businesses that have been started since 2000 that have zero employees. Those ones don't actually help our economic growth but there's a whole lot of them. And they pull the average number of small businesses up. Um, the yellow is the businesses, where's the yellow? Business with 50 to 249 employees. And you can see that they're, they're up broadly from 2000. Um, 109 is the 1 to 49. And, but look at what's happened with our firms less than 200, sorry, with more than 250 employees. That's not, great news, and if we can get more of them shifted, you know, if we can get this number going up or continuing this trend to go up, um, that would be a good thing. And it's very doable because we discovered there's a number of things that we can do, um, and I'm saying there are a number of things we should do. So the methodology, so to put together this report, the first thing that we did um, is we, um, after, uh, after being asked by the Information Economy Council to do it, um, we formed a steering group, which I talked about earlier. We also formed an ambassador group to take it forward afterwards because uh, one of the clearest lessons from here is that it's collaboration. We will achieve a lot of collaboration between academia and business and government. And um, we then read 148 research reports, which was really fun um, and very interesting. And um, this report builds in particular on, uh, on work from Aston, Oxford, Cambridge, sadly not LSE actually, but we obviously didn't read enough. Um, anyway, and the version two will do LSE. Um, Babson, um, Boston Consulting Group, Nesta, OECD, Kaufman, a lot of different research, and some government reports, um, particularly by Lord Young and Adonis, and Sainsbury did the McKinsey Center for Cities in the Hessel Time report. Um, that was 148, so that sort of took us from March until June, um, very much aided and abetted by Tamara there in the front row. We did a number of workshops with practitioners and policymakers, and I didn't put the number because I really can't remember how many we did. Um, we draft, we put a draft of the recommendations to the Information Economy Councils on the 1st of July. Um, that one had uh, 26 recommendations in it. This one has 12. Um, and it doesn't mean we got less ambitious, but it means we got rid of the, we really focused on what were the really critical things um, to be getting on with. Um, we then had additional meetings with policymakers and other practitioners, 300 of them, um, meant for a very nice summer. Um, and, uh, and we did a lot of peer review because peer review is always really important when you're um, talking about such a big work. We surveyed, sorry, we also surveyed hundreds of scale-up CEOs to find out what was important to them. And in particular, we asked them to force rank the recommendations that we were thinking about. We really wanted to know what was keeping them up at night. Um, and there were 363 of them. We ended up eliminating uh, all but 203 of them, because they didn't fit our criteria that I mentioned earlier. They had to be above 10 employees. They had to be growing at least 20% for the last, the last three years. Um, and that was important, because I wanted to be able to go back to them in a couple of years and see how, how we've done. Um, we reviewed a number of initiatives around the world looking at scaling up, not just starting up, but scaling up. Um, there are a lot of initiatives, but not all of them are effective. And we wanted to give a recipe book, as it were, of initiatives that were working and were producing results around the world. Um, so we reviewed 75. Um, this is where they were, um, all over the place. We couldn't get Singapore onto the map somehow. But anyway, this is where they were. Um, and you can see, the good news is there's a, quite a lot in the UK. Um, in the back of, you've got the printed copy. 
in the online copy, there are 29 case studies, which is your recipe book if you're an entrepreneur or if you're a policymaker. And if you want to know what's really working around the world and what we should get started with tomorrow, um, that's where to go. Um, we commissioned Deloitte uh, and uh, RBS volunteered. And Nesta, um, we collaborated with you because it built on a lot of your work um, over the summer. And you added up the numbers and subtracted the numbers. Well, actually, you added them up. I kept on adding them up. You subtracted them because um, you're a proper econometrician. Um, but, uh, and, and later on, um, these guys are going to come and talk about th what the numbers are and how they add up to anywhere near the number that we're talking about, which is a big, which is a big number to the peer review. Um, so now I'm going to quickly troll through um, observations from all of those interviews and reading those 148 research reports and analyzing all of the answers from all of those CEOs and hopefully it won't go too fast. We're going to try to keep it a fairly good pace. So um, the first message is that our economy is growing really fast and it's increasing. 40% of our GDP is generated by companies less than 15 years old. In addition to that, uh, other recent research tells us that 100% of the net new jobs are from companies less than five years old. Been to a careers fair lately? Are they all young companies or old companies? Um, I'm suggesting, uh, along with the CBI, that we drop the word SME, small and medium-sized enterprise, is what does it mean? In, in where 100% where of the net new jobs are from companies less, you know, more, uh, less than five years old, SME doesn't talk about the dynamism in our, in our economy. And it probably was relevant at the time that it was invented, but I don't think it's relevant any longer. And I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest that we should drop it. So if you hear someone using the word SME, tell them they shouldn't. Um, the other thing that we've learned, or it's become very apparent, I probably, when I started this, I thought I might be writing a finance report or a report on tech. I didn't think I was going to be writing a report on the skills crisis. But this report and the answers to our um, scale-up mystery is absolutely about skills. There's a massive skills gap, and it's increasing. Um, at the moment, there are 990,000 open jobs in the UK. And these companies claim they cannot accept customer orders because they cannot find people with the right skills to work for them. That's really not very helpful at all. Um, in addition to that, the Royal Society spent three years putting together a report of their own on the skills gap. And they're forecasting that in addition to that 990,000 open jobs, there'll be another million open jobs um, that come from the, the science and uh, the STEM, STEM subjects. In addition to that, if that wasn't bad enough, OECD is forecasting that the app economy is going to generate an additional 5.8 million jobs by 2018. And if we don't know how to program apps or kids coming out of schools and universities don't know how to help program apps, they won't be the ones that get those jobs. The other thing that we found in the survey was that depending on how many people you were employing, uh, you thought you had different problems. And so one of the things we found, and again, going back to the is it the skills, the number one thing that's keeping the, the people who run these, who are creating these jobs up at night is they can't find enough people with the right skills. Um, the interesting thing is that it's, it's a bit of, I mean, it's a big issue for all of them. It's number one, two, or three. It's not really an issue for the, the smaller type ones. Uh, all of 74, but it's very acute between 100 and 250 and 250 and 499. So if you're a policy person, you should really understand who you're asking the questions of when you're asking questions and advice on policy. Because if you ask, just the, the very, very small ones, or the ones that don't even have 10 employees, you will get a very different answer. And that's illustrated a little bit further on as well about tax breaks. We often hear about tax breaks, but it was really not that big an issue um, uh, for the smaller ones. It's a bigger issue for the bigger ones. Um, if you want to look at loan finance, which we hear about all of the time, and it's apparently a huge issue, um, it's not that huge an issue, particularly when they're asked to force rank. The number one, number two is skills and leadership. Oh, sorry, let me scoot past that one so fast. Um, and then finally, VC funding. We often hear about VC, but it's inversely related to how large the company is. So if you're only speaking to small people who are in incubators, that's what they're going to worry about. But if you're talking about the ones that are generating the jobs and, and, and really boosting your economy, it might not be the thing that should be your number one worry. 
So uh, just a number of sort of surprising things that we found in our, in our meanderings. Um, the other thing is that because Britain's quite a small country, there's only 61 million people here, it's super important if we want to get our companies to be as big as Apple or Google that, um, that, they, that they do do that, they're global. And if they're global, that means that they taste the fruits of lots of different countries. And they also taste the fruits of different countries' regulators and agencies. And so it's really very important for us, if we're a regulator or an agency, to make sure that we compare well to other countries and that we measure that. Um, very, very interesting in the US, um, that is more done on a, a sort of statewide basis, they have an, a regulatory climate index for their startups. And if it's really, so you can see here, New York, they're the, you know, they're the bottom of the rank. And they are trying to go up and make it easier for companies to come to them. These cities are all competing with each other to be the best place for companies to come and scale up. And I think that we should probably think about this on a European basis, and well, if, if we're only thinking about Europe, and certainly on a global basis. Um, the vital 6% report from Nesta. Um, we know that um, these small companies do, do very much drive the employment growth. Um, and we know from recent research, a couple, uh, literally a couple weeks ago, that it's 1% of those now that drive 36% of the jobs. So that's wonderful, because those 8,923 companies can be targeted. There's only 225 per city. You can do that. Um, Jeff, you're going to talk about that, so I'm skipping over, skipping over that slide. Uh, and on the productivity as well, the, oops, the smaller firms um, tend to be less productive than the larger firms um, because of economies of scale and a bunch of other things. Uh, that's Jeff's slide. Um, the only other thing, too, again, focusing if you're a policymaker on early stage young companies isn't necessarily that great because um, the average sales of a, of a company that can be identified by age is 23,000 pounds as opposed to, you remember, if it's growing, it's up to 170,000 pounds. So again, if you're trying to get economic growth, you need to focus on the things that are producing it. I'm going to change pace here, I lost track. Um, so the message there, if it wasn't really clear, scale-ups are not start-ups. Um, and we should develop a slightly more sophisticated view of entrepreneurship because there's different aspects of it that we should all think about that is, um, that is important. Um, this was from the RBS, uh, RBS Matt, um, talking about, and it, you know, it should be quite obvious, the average employment of you know, a larger company, if we can get them up to large and scaling nicely, is 1,502. Average employment of the smaller ones, that. Um, so let's focus on the thing that's going to give us the biggest bang for a buck. Um, there's a really, yesterday, the, the professor who um, teaches how to scale up eco economies to policy leaders from more than 20 countries likens it to, it's really easy to produce a baby, but it's not that easy to produce a grown child. Um, and that's sort of the difference a little bit. So you need to focus, if you're trying to focus on scaling up companies and the economic benefit that will be co come from that, you need to focus on the ecosystem that th the startup goes through. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, there is a scale-up gap in the UK. We scale up fewer companies than they do in many other economies. Um, this graph here shows you the UK has a large number of static firms that neither grow nor shrink, and it's got far less companies that shrink, and it's got far less companies that grow. They've got some companies that grow really fast but they don't grow really fast for long enough. Um, and we can see that because they don't get up to 250 employees and they don't get up, get up to the, the, the turnover that I was talking about. So if you're going into the Entrepreneurship um, Matters course that starts next week, make sure that you're aiming for a really big company um, that's gonna grow across lots of borders. Um, I just wanna pull in an example from the Endeavor program um, which talks about the high quality jobs. I was talking to someone the other day and they said, but who would want to work for somebody like a Google or an Apple? Why would they have to work 100 hours a week and it looks horrible? And I said, well, first of all, if they could find the people, they might not have to work 100 hours a week. But um, I do remember this survey that talked about um, the job satisfaction is far higher. So if you do work at one of these scale ups, 80% of those, uh, the people who work there love it. Um, compared to 46% of those who have jobs, normal jobs, at static firms. What you find is that they're excited about what they're doing, they're excited about their product, they're excited about changing the world, um, and there's no time for politicking and some of that other stuff that you watch about on TV with um, 
programs with companies that don't grow that fast. Don't know why that's in there again. Um, other surprising points, because my background is in tech, I thought I might be writing about tech. Um, we found that a huge amount of the benefit was not just tech or digital. It actually has to do with science and the IP. If you're perfecting a product here that's based on a science, you get it right in one country, and to get it global, to get to be massive size, you spread it out across a whole bunch of other countries. Um, and this shows here the fastest science-based companies across the UK. And you can see they're not just in London. Um, and the other thing to note is that their, um, their growth rate is, uh, was 92% between 2012 and 2013. So they're growing really, really fast. That's like, it makes, it pales the 20% sort of hurdle that we're trying to go for. Um, so again, if you're, if you're a student, you're looking for a job, think of a science one. I'm gonna dip into Cambridge a little bit, but I know that we're not in Cambridge. Um, the reason I do that is because we have really good data for Cambridge. And it talks about 17% uh, growth in employment and 24% growth in revenues. That's really, really fast. The economy is not growing that fast. Other key messages uh, that we need to know is it's all about working together. If we work together, we can achieve amazing things, and if we don't work together, then it's very expensive and it doesn't work. Um, talked about Endeavor. Um, one of the things about collaboration being key is the co if you collaborate, the cost of producing a job falls dramatically. And what we found with, with Mass Challenge and Venture Fest, both of which are case studies, are that it costs um, about 1,200 pounds to create a job. If you do it alone, some of, the some of the policy shows that it costs 37,000 pounds to create a job. So alone, bad, together and a collaborative thing, good. Um, the other thing that we learned from all of these case studies is that it doesn't actually require a lot of money. In fact, it hardly requires any money. Endeavor, the program that I showed earlier that, you, that uh, costs 1,000, sorry, 405 pounds per job, has never had any funds at all from the government. So the ecosystem, just working together and aligning interests can produce amazing things. And I think that's probably also what we found in Cambridge for the first 50 years as well, isn't it, David? Um, so it would be cold calling David Cleverly there in the audience. Um, there, again, 50, you know, oldest, oldest cluster, not ever had any government support whatsoever to get the cluster going. And you saw earlier that it's going pretty well as a cluster. Um, so we're starting from strong base. I built that in. So. The ambition, and I'll talk about some of the targets. I have put targets into the report. I do have clear views about if we were to raise it, how many scale-ups we would have in the next five to 20 years. Um, this shows that I think that it should be our base ambition to close the gap, but the real ambition should be to reverse the gap. And I think the UK is actually ideally placed to be able to reverse the gap. I think that we should be able to get more scale-ups per proportion of our population than the US. You look at our science base, you look at our geographic position between Asia and the US, and you look at our population of 500 million that is within reach. I don't see any reason why we can't get it, and I absolutely reject anything about, um, we had a, uh, uh, about our, uh, our entrepreneurs being less ambitious or less capable or not having the right sort of entrepreneurial DNA. I think that is utter rubbish. Uh, and so because of that and because of the other advantages that we have as a nation, we should be able to get there. So the recommendations are clumped sort of into five. The first is that we release data so that we can identify what these fast growing companies are. At the moment, uh, and actually we do have quite a lot of data to suggest where they are, but we have to crunch it quite a lot. Um, there are some com countries that we found, Denmark, to name exactly which one that's the most, um, most interesting. They use their HMRC data to tell on an almost instant basis which companies are gaining faster customer orders better than others. The data that I showed you from Cambridge um, uh, is on company's house data, which is fantastic, but it's 18 months out of date. If you diagnose somebody with an issue and you want to apply a treatment to them, waiting 18 months after they've gone through this issue is not excellent, which is why we would, I would, I'm calling for a release of other data. Um, I'm gonna talk through these a little bit later. So the release of the data, we're asking that national data sets um, from HMRC are released so that we can see pretty much instantly, um, without very much delay, which companies are growing the fastest. That will, and again using Cambridge Cluster Map and Denmark as an example. The other thing um, is that if we are going to be spending money on entrepreneurship widely defined, 
I'm asking that in the future they, uh, we report on and think about those that actually are getting of the entrepreneurship realm, those that are focusing on and getting results with scale-ups. Because we now know, beyond any shadow of any doubt, that it's the scale-ups that produce the economic growth. So if that's what we really want and that's what we need, and we have, you know, we do need economic growth looking at some of the stats out yesterday. I think Japan really should focus on scale-ups. This would solve Japan's issue as far as I'm concerned. Anyway, so data would be really helpful. It's a platform that everybody could use. Um, we asked the scale-ups if they would mind the government using the data that they had given for their VAT result, uh, receipts and their PAYE, and 83% of them would be in favor of the government using that. We were fearful that they would say, oh no, my data is very private. I wouldn't possibly want anybody to find out that I was growing fast. Um, but 80, for 83% of them, it's not a problem. Also in Cambridge, we released this data on which companies with their revenues and their employees, and not one company has ever asked to opt out. Um, and in fact, nine to 89 companies have asked to opt in. Um, oops, sorry. Um, oh, it's going all over the place, isn't it? Sorry, increased collaboration. Um, we, I told you we looked at 75 case studies, and there, there were a lot of them, and those that were the most effective and had the lowest cost per job produced were highly collaborative. So I'm suggesting that we all look into those collaborations which work, and we try to spread them throughout the country so that we can help the leaders everywhere um, do it. I've asked for a minister to be made responsible for scale-ups, and I've asked, um, and I've suggested that a task force is from industry and academia are, is appointed or named so that they can deliver a scale-up report to the Prime Minister every November during Global Entrepreneurship Week, because um, we know Global Entrepreneurship Week always happens the third week of November. Um, and they launched the Tech City Initiative November 2011. Um, 2012 was the, you know, the map going live in Cambridge, so it all sort of adds up. Um, the things in orange are the case studies. Those are the things that we found around the world that were really, really effective. You can get them online if you want to find out about them. It talks about the economic impact. In some cases, they've gone back and they've used these policies for 20 years. Um, on improving skills, which you remember was the number one problem, um, uh, again, thing that was keeping everybody awake at night, we've suggested um, that, the, that we really do get kids with the right level of numeracy and literacy and that we expose uh, the, the students at colleges and schools to entrepreneurs so that they can think of this as a viable career, as a viable career. Um, so I love and applaud that, uh, that you're, what you're doing with your entrepreneurship society here. Recommendation six, um, there's a local flavor here. The other thing that I discovered that I don't think I was really expecting was the ecosystem for entrepreneurship and particularly for boosting the economic impact of it only happens at a local level. So national isn't that great. Um, you can have a national policy. In this case, we're saying national release the data so that that can be a platform for the local, the cities, clusters, or LEPs, whatever you want to call them, to use. And indeed, also for UKTI to use so that they can identify these. So I'm pointing at <laughs> Priya, who's here from, the, um, from UKTI, um, so that they can use that. And again, these examples here of things that are working really, really well. Um, recommendation seven um, talks about a scale-up visa. Um, in Canada, there is a visa that's available to scale-up firms. Um, they get it within two weeks. It's a temporary visa, but allows them to hire a foreign worker to help them fill their customer orders. That's what I'm talking about here for a scale-up visa. It should be granted at the local level so that if uh, the company can't get it, it's the mayor or the local MP who's gonna agitate to get the visa granted, and they can all visit the company to make sure it's a company with employees, because they won't need to know that, because they'll use their tax records to request the, the visa. Um, again, these are the survey findings, 87%. I would be able to grow my company faster if university graduates had the skills needed to meet my customer demand. Very simple, very clear message call from industry. Um, I can more easily hire talented people from overseas um, who had scaled a company like mine before. Develop and meet <coughs> leadership. So the other, the last, or not the last, recommendation eight talks about when you're growing a company from 50 to 100 to 250 to 1,000 employees, it's really very hard. And in addition to trying to hire people to work for you, you've got the people who already work for you, and they're going through a little bit of stress because they're trying to do different things for different customers and more customers in more countries all of the time. Um, and there's a call for flexible educational programs, exec ed pro programs, just for 
these, uh, these CEOs of these fast growth firms or the CIOs or the CFOs to help them go through that. Industry has a bunch of things that popped up to try to solve this problem and they're very effective, but they only cover approximately 120, they, their capacity for cohorts right now is about 120. Remember there's 8,900 firms that need these, 89 of which are complaining that they need these. Um, I've spoken about that already. And champion success stories, one of the things that the media can do brilliantly and also the government is talk about the companies that are growing rather than the latest business plan competition or a Dragon's Den sort of thing. Let's talk about those companies that are growing and celebrate them and get them on the map. We can all do that. Um, and there's a number of um, things that are doing that. Oh, sorry, and the other thing is when we asked companies if they wanted to be identified and if it would help them, 87% said yes. So that's good. Said that again. I'm recommendation 10. I'm going to skip over these, is about regulation. In a global world, our regulators and our agencies that interact often with our fast growth companies need to make sure that they compare well, um, or at least not unwell, to the, um, to the other countries. Um, 11, we're doing a lot of great things on finance. I've suggested we do more great things on finance. I haven't made any specific recommendation on finance. Is that keep on, you're going on the run. A lot of things have been done in finance. I think we're in good shape there. And 12, um, on infrastructure, we're making great strides forward in, on infrastructure already. The things that are being done with bandwidth across London and elsewhere are important and are working. Um, there was one thing that we found out from Boston, strangely. Uh, they had great programs to move these scale-ups, not, not one to five employees, but 30 to 50, 70 to 100 employees easily. And they, they managed, the mayors got the real estate developers together and knocked heads until they agreed to make flexible, not cheap, but flexible terms for these companies to, to grow through. And I think we could do that here. Um, the reason it's a, almost a non-recommendation is because it's patchy around the country. It's acute in London, it's acute in Cambridge, it doesn't matter as much up north, so not everybody across the country was calling for infrastructure, um, which is why it's there. Um, we've mentioned that before, and I think that's about it. They can grow faster, lots of things we can do. Um, the impact, just going to touch on this as a segue onto our next pan, our, onto our, our other speakers and respondents is if you just do a simple, normal media like, how big will it be? And having read 148 reports in the recent past, um, this is what usually comes from reports. It, you, know, you do a, you a simple one and you say, okay, if we just got the 0.4 up to the point, you know, 0.4 up to the 0.7, what would it add up to? Um, well, you get 3 million jobs and 516 billion over the 20 years. So it's a really very big, sizable number that adds up. Um, it doesn't take into consideration productivity, which Jeff Mulgan's about to talk about. Um, if you did add the productivity, and it's debatable whether you should, and we're going to debate that, um, it would, um, you could come up to your, your, over in one year, your productivity adds up to 96 billion. If you, disca if you uh, took only the scale-ups and assumed it was 40% and you added it up, you would add 768 billion onto the 516 billion, and you get into your trillion numbers for the economic benefit of being able to close the scale-up gap, if that's what our ambition is, um, which it may not be. So that's where we go. How do we make it happen? I think we know what we need to do. Um, cooperate between policy, finance, culture, human capital. There's a load of things which all of us can do and can do. So public policy, culture, let me skip. this is all in the report, which you've got in front of you. So, that's what you do, very simple things. Schools in particular, big problem, get the entrepreneurs in, universities get the entrepreneurs in. Role models are really, really important. And that's it. And it should not require significant money. We don't have a lot of money spare right now, um, and it doesn't need a lot of money. The examples that we looked at from all around the world didn't have government money making it happen. You aligned interests in the different players different stakeholders, and they made it happen because it was in everybody's interest. But the key thing is that you have to release the data so that we can identify, so that the local ecosystems can identify who they need to um, focus on as role models and to help them get customers for and so forth. With that, I think that's me done. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much.
Cherry. Now we have uh, three uh, experts, contributors to the uh, manifesto who are going to make brief presentations and then we will open the floor to your questions. And our first contributor is Tamara Raja, who is a partner with McKinsey. Tamara. Oh, it's here. Sorry. Do you want that? main takeaways from this report has been that, th that making scale-ups happen is not a question of individuals and it's not a question of any individual initiative either. Um, Sherry emphasised the point, it's about collaboration between a group of stakeholders in a local system and these stakeholders are diverse. It's the government, media, educators, industry, the entrepreneurs themselves, investors, all coming together and targeting a series of interventions and that is what really creates the scale-up ecosystem, as it's defined. Now, what we did was we wanted to really see what is it that makes a great scale-up ecosystem. So if we go back to the most basic notion of an ecosystem, the biological definition, well, it's often a biodiverse collection of living and non-living things that give each other energy. They're interconnecting, they're interdependent, and there's symbiotic relationships for oxygen and nourishment. Now, if we apply that to our context, we're talking about the entrepreneurial ecosystems with the right membership, the right commitments, and the right collaborations to provide much needed oxygen to scaling businesses. So we took a look around the world, Sherry mentioned 75 cases from over 20 different countries. And I want to give a really whistle-stop tour of some of the main examples. And I, I just, before um, I go through these, just caveat, we picked out, we really looked for impact. So some of these ecosystems aren't the most known, but the interventions that are going on are really showing measurable differences to the scale-ups. So first, this is uh, North Carolina. Now, North Carolina in the 50s was in the midst of a recession and suffering from huge brain drain to other states, um, with an average wage over a third below the rest of the US. And who was working together here? Well, the government, in collaboration with the state's three universities that you can see marked on the map, and they led an initiative to really focus on small businesses and how to grow them to reverse the economic trends. They founded the Research Triangle part that some of you may have heard about. Now, what was crucial to the success of this the involvement of universities from the beginning. Um, the park was even located equidistant between the universities. Um, infrastructure being built um, around the universities uh, with government involvement, obviously. And the universities, even today, are feeding the talent into the businesses that are growing in the area, scientists, engineers, managers. Who else was involved? Large corporates. IBM entered in 1965, again setting the stage for another influx of highly trained workers. And maybe most importantly, and this is one of the key factors of an ecosystem, the entrepreneurs themselves, once they scaled up, they reinvested, they committed and reinvested into this local system. One example, the Blackstone Entrepreneurs Network, which even today is identifying and then networking the serial and successful entrepreneurs and linking them, identifying the next um, generation of high growth companies and linking these successful entrepreneurs to them to be the role models and mentors for their um, scaling up. Now, our next destination um, has no brain drain problem, but despite having a central hub location, Cambridge needed to ensure that all of its scaling companies were linked not only with one another, but also with local businesses, with local investors, and so they organized into various communities that again bring together the universities, the entrepreneurs, the businesses, the financing communities, and there's several examples here. Um, What's happening now is digital me methods. Sherry mentioned Cambridge being one of the places with the most data. There's the Cambridge cluster map, which again identifies who are the big, fastest growing companies in Cambridge 50 that picks out the top 50 of those so that interventions can be really targeted to them. Where else did we look? Well, Singapore. Now, Singapore became an independent country um, about 50 years ago and faced low levels of economic prosperity, few obvious growth drivers. And so the government really made a conscious effort to see what would it take to raise uh, the whole country to a level that it could support really fast growing um, companies. Now, one of the recommendations, oh, several of the recommendations in the report are around talent. And the report makes the fa fact that this isn't a short term play, it's a 10, 20 year thing to raise um, the level of talent in this country so that it can really um, support the kind of fast growing companies that we have. And this is what Singapore did and what they're still doing. They prioritize skill development so they're now the top ranked country in several um, kind of rank elite tables around maths and science. 
they focused on attracting foreign talent as well to Singapore, and they also worked with industry, with what large corporates, again, in this ecosystem, to position Singapore as a destination for R&D, for regional headquarters and other things. They send talent overseas to Silicon Valley, to other hubs, to learn about what it really takes to scale and grow companies, and then they return to Singapore and apply that knowledge. And Singapore is now, over time, starting to see some major exits. Another example we looked at, Estonia. Now, Estonia, or e-Estonia, as some of the programs are called, is, has a real collaboration between the government and the country's ICT industry to make Estonia one of the most digitally progressive countries in the whole world, a digital nation which is now providing growth opportunities for a whole range of digital businesses. And what they've really tried to do is put every single sector online. So if you look across public safety, healthcare, education, business, government, infrastructure, etc., there is so much that has been done to dig digitize this. Secure mobile payments, a secure platform for storing, sharing, and digitally signing documents, um, digital signatures, 90% of residents have um, e-ID cards, which puts all that data online. Funds to help next generation product development. So there's a company called Prototron, which is a fund investing in prototype development. Now, it's not just the first prototype that's important, but as a company grows, you know, version two, three, four, five, the next generation product development, there's money um, and the opportunities available to do that. And also platforms for entrepreneurs as they're growing to capitalize on. So the electronic health registry, which integrates data from different healthcare providers to create common records for patients. Um, Businesses can feed off that, and it, it provides them the fuel for their, for their next um, development. Now, the last thing to mention about Estonia is, again, like Singapore, focusing on the talent. And even five-year-olds are learning coding there. There's a project, Project Tiger. Um, so talent and that, that upgrading of talent is really starting at the grassroots. And we're seeing scaling companies, Skype, Playtech, TransferWise. Um, all of those came from Estonia. Now, I want to end with some hubs which are maybe very well known. So if you think about Boston, um, Boston has world-class universities. It has a lot of infrastructure that's already in place that made it a great startup hub. Now, what are they doing to really promote these scaling companies? Two things I want to pick out. One, they have, they bring together the most successful CEOs from industry with companies who are scaling. And the idea is to share best practices and lessons. There are so many organized roundtables, um, the Mass Tech Hub, the Mass Scale CEO Roundtable. The second thing they're doing is bringing together university and industry to, again, help with this advanced product development cycles for companies that are growing. So they have um, centers that offer, uh, company, uh, that offer facilities for life science companies to help as they go to the next stages of R&D um, as they're scaling, Microsoft technology centers, which provide access to expertise as you scale, um, and you can go and do your next generation product development there. And again, finally ending in San Francisco, which is one of the um, world's most known hubs. Um, what are they doing? Well, the San Francisco mayor has identified every single high growth company in San Francisco. So the mayor knows each of those. And when he goes abroad um, with the sharing economy concept and to sister, state, uh, sister cities in, in other countries, knows which um, companies he needs to look out for uh, business development opportunities for overseas. So really helping scale, helping that international expansion. Um, these logos that you can see along the top is a, an endeavor by the city, the whole city for an uh, entrepreneurship in residence program, um, which is helping bring together the private sector, the city departments, and scaling businesses, and providing them with new business opportunities around civic challenges. Um, so again, helping provide further platforms for um, the scaling businesses to, uh, to con continue to grow. So six crucial players um, that need to collaborate in, a, in this ecosystem. Uh, the key success factors that, that Sherry touched on. And I want to end by saying this. Now, these are all the countries. I've got the Singapore, Singapore on there now. Oh, um, <laughs> there it is on, on the right hand side. So look, at, these are all the places we looked at. Just look how much is already going on in the UK. So we're really starting from a position of strength. Um, we have a huge number of collaborative initiatives with lots of these, those six stakeholders already working together. And with a little bit more momentum, identifying who are our scale-up companies and really targeting interventions to them, um, we have the, a foundation to build a great scale-up ecosystem. Thank you. <laughs>
Um, it's also a challenge because I've got to try and condense 15,000 words into four minutes. So um, without further ado, let me outline why I think there are the four main reasons uh, why the scale-up programme uh, will drive the policy agenda uh, in the UK and globally moving forward. The first of those is around the potential uh, and the impact, which is likely to be very significant. So the identification, holistic support and role model effects uh, that scale ups likely to deliver will generate economic growth. If additional impacts akin to those estimated by Mark Hart for the Goldman Sachs programmes come to fruition, uh, we reckon that there'll be an additional 45,000 jobs in the UK due to scale up by 2034. Uh, which aligns with a 70 billion uh, increase in cumulative GDP over the period. Um, now, they are uh, fairly, um, fairly small assumptions, and if those assumptions do prove to be conservative uh, and we exhibit the kind of growth seen overseas through the Endeavour programme, you would look at those impacts trebling over the same period, so up to 225 billion in GDP terms over that period. Uh, the range is broad, uh, and necessarily so, and if you take a look at our report, you'll see some of the un assumptions underlying it, uh, but we do feel that that illustrates the potential um, to, to generate economic growth here. Secondly, um, there's an even greater potential uh, for produ productivity gain, um, and I don't want to steal too much of Jeff's thunder. Uh, Jeff from Nesta is going to speak in a moment about that. Uh, but our analysis actually excludes specific productivity gains driven across the economy by high growth firms. So high growth firms or scale ups are typically defined on either employment growth or turnover growth. And if it's employment growth, turnover sometimes takes a while to catch up. And because of that, uh, as you'd expect, uh, productivity tends to be lower. If scale up, um, if the firm is defined on turnover, uh, what you tend to see um, for platform effects or companies that are, are built around a platform and are not labour intensive, uh, turnover grows quickly relative to employment and productivity increases. And so depending on the t exact type of organisation, you will see different productivity effects over time. And so since we've concluded our research, the work from Nesta and also some work from ONS uh, has shed more light on this. And, and more light will be shed going forward um, as, as the data improves. But what this says for both labour productivity and total factor productivity, high growth firms are thought to, to, to help drive productivity growth going forward. So thirdly, and very importantly, is a point that Sherry made, is the local potential um, of scale. It's not just about London. It's not just exclusively urban. Um, and there is potential in the regions. So, Typically, for a consultant, you probably can't make, make out any of the labels on, on this chart, but it does, <laughs> I can tell you what it shows, uh, and, and it does appear in our report. But what it's basically saying is that the conurbations are higher up the chart. So in absolute terms, more high-growth firms in London, Manchester, Birmingham, etc. Uh, what it also shows is the relative incidence of those high-growth firms varies. And so what we've measured it on here is on a per capita basis. And so to the right of the y-axis, you see all the blues and they're southern. To the left, the greens, uh, and, and they're all northern. And, and so what this tells me is that there's much potential here. And that potential is not just for London. It's not just for the south of England. There's potential to develop, uh, develop the north of England through this. And that plays into the wider policy, uh, policy move towards decentralization of policy. Finally, better use of data. So we've been plugging this for, for a number of years now. Um, by sharing public sector information uh, and using that data in a more efficient way, policymakers and other stakeholders, you can really drive outcomes. Um, as Sherry said, the YouGov, YouGov survey said quite clearly that over 80% uh, of scale-ups would be content to share their business data with policymakers and others. And so by doing that, they can gain better support. Uh, and, and it's mutually beneficial. Uh, we recognise this is a non-trivial exercise uh, to, to release uh, public sector information and it may cost, but we think this is at the core uh, of what is going to drive impact uh, from scale up over the coming years. So they, very briefly, are the four reasons why I think this is going to be very important to policy moving forward. Very happy to take your questions uh, and our report is available online. Thanks very much. Thank you very much.
told the uh, by-election tomorrow will be won by UKIP uh, because uh, the rest of England hates London. So maybe we're getting some insights here into how London become, can become more attractive to the uh, rest of the country as the uh, startups in the provinces do well. So our final speaker is uh, Jeff Mulgan. He's chief executive of the National Endowment for Science, Technology and the Arts. Jeff. Well, good evening. I I'm your last bit of bombardment before you can bombard us back with some, uh, some challenging questions. Um, I, I think this whole report and exercise is essentially spot on in both diagnosis and prescription. And I say that coming from an organization which is involved in investing in early stage companies, backing accelerators, backing networks of startups and doing research. And we're almost congenitally disposed in favor of startup culture. Uh, the idea which probably is shared by many of you in this room that it's good to start your own company, to take a risk, to dive in as part of an entrepreneurial culture. But we've also been involved in many years of, um, of research, um, uh, which has shown uh, a slightly more complicated picture. It's shown again and again that the whole startup field is in fact surrounded by quite a lot of mythology uh, as well as fact. And that much of what's driven governments around certainly the Western world and increasingly the rest of the world in the last generation has been rather misconceived essentially focusing on quantity of startups rather than quality of startups and scaling up. Um, some of you may have seen our research in the past on this, which has shown, as Sherry said, that a very large proportion of new jobs come from a pretty small proportion of high growth firms. That is true in all sectors or regions. Uh, perhaps more surprisingly, if you look at where the high growth firms are in terms of age. They're not usually the very young firms. It's often a few years on that they start growing fast and creating jobs and wealth. Some of the mythology of, well, not the mythology, but the examples of the very rapid uh, growth of some digital firms in the US is not quite uh, 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 so relevant to the norm, normal patterns uh, elsewhere. And if you look at patterns of survival, Perhaps not surprisingly, only a very small proportion of startups survive and grow and create a lot of jobs. And so in essence, we've been arguing policy should be much more concerned about that group at the, the bottom, uh, the small number of firms, which Sherry's now identified per LEP, rather than focusing on quantity of startup at the top. And often, actually starting up a business isn't all that smart a thing to do if you do it too young or in the wrong sectors or in the wrong conditions. Um, the work we've done in the last few months, which has fed into this report, is really about how this whole debate relates to probably the central issue of modern UK economic policy. What, what do we do about productivity growth? <coughs> productivity has been stagnating in this country for the last few years, and almost every commentator, every economist has been scratching their heads to work out uh, why. If you break down analytically where productivity is influenced by firms entering markets or exiting markets, you see a rather surprising pattern. Um, if you read Economics 101, I guess, as many of you will have done, or you read Schumpeter, you would expect entering firms, new firms with radically new business models, to be the key source of productivity growth. Instead, as you can see here, uh, the average new business isn't more productive than the average existing business. A small minority of high productivity startups are really important to boosting productivity, but the average isn't. Similarly, exiting firms, rather worryingly, are not all rubbish firms. And here we've shown a high proportion of the firms leaving markets are very high productivity firms you might want to help to grow, which have often superior business models. Uh, and uh, often uh, the continuing firms, the incumbents, play a pretty big role in productivity, partly for the reasons of scaling, economies of scale and scope and learning curve uh, effects. And indeed, they are explaining most of recent productivity growth in the UK. Rather different, very different from a conventional wisdom of much of what you read about in, in newspapers. Now, what this analysis also has shown, perhaps even more worryingly, is a, a, a trend decline, certainly in the last decade up to the financial crisis, of a worsening of allocative efficiency in the economy. 
That is to say, the ability of the economy to shift capital, labor, and other resources to the most productive firms. That's what you need for an economy to uh, grow. Uh, and this is what's generated the figure in the report of 96 billion of lost GDP, perhaps 5% uh, in total, perhaps well, several thousand pounds per uh, employee in the country lost because of these trends. And those partly have to do with a decline in our ability as an economy to grow the firms we should be growing. This is why I strongly endorse the thrust of this report. This is a very major part of our broader economic problems, our malaise, and risks leading us, as in much of the US, to stagnant incomes for most employees if we don't solve the productivity problem. Just one very brief final point. The report is full of good case studies, analyses from around the world. I think, though, there is a broader challenge we have in this field, and this, we're in a university, so I will say this, that there's been re remarkably little rigorous testing of policy in relation to business support, entrepreneurship, anywhere in the world. So although we have some good assessments and evaluations, they don't have the rigor you get in healthcare or even in the best of education and other fields now. And in the last month, we launched a thing called the Innovation Growth Lab, which is a collaboration with partners, many of whom Sherry mentioned, like the Kaufman Foundation in the US, governments in Denmark, the Netherlands, Australia, uh, and quite a few around the world, to actually test programs of business support with control groups using randomized control trials. A very simple idea, but completely novel. And our, is that the one thing I think missing from the recommendations, I think we need to do much more of this. Biz is beginning to do it in the UK. We need to actually apply the same experimental rigor to business support that we expect in the other best fields of public policy so that someone doing an exercise like this in five years' time will have, I think, even more confidence in putting forward recommendations about how money can achieve the greatest impact. Thank you. Okay, uh, so we have about uh, 15 minutes for questions. Uh, we have roving mics. We'll take three questions at a time. And could I encourage you to keep your questions to short questions so that we can have a few contributions? We have a gentleman in a red jumper there, and then a gentleman two rows behind. Um, hi, this is um, a simple question. I don't know who to address it to. Um, how do you distinguish your approach from what used to be called picking winners? I mean, I, I get the sense that this is just sort of, you know, another way of trying to pick winners. And how is that different this time around? And sorry, could you, next question, or just introduce yourself very briefly? Who you are. Thank you very much. Gentlemen. Um, my name is uh, Gianluca. Gianluca. I'm um, a self-employed um, consultant. Um, in football, in football, I do football. Anyway, my question is uh, that I've been impressed by the, what the young lady, don't remember her name, probably Tamara, the young lady talked about uh, 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 ecosystem or biosystem, I don't know. Uh, basically, she said that it's crucial that in every kind of new venture is the, the business environment, that all, all the stuff around the business environment. So I was wondering, she made some example about Singapore, about uh, London, about uh, other city, uh, San Francisco, blah, blah. But in other country, where probably they are struggling even for the economic recession, do you think is uh, something that is uh, out of blue to create uh, a good environment to build uh, new initiatives? Or it can, can be something that uh, can create a new, can I say, mild economic uh, growth? Thank you. Is there another question on that side of the uh, question? Over here. Let's take this. Thank you. Uh, yes. Hello. Uh, yes, my name is Tom Kadala. I'm a journalist. Um, uh, the question I have is what, what there was a thing that Sherry uh, put on the slide which intrigued me, which is uh, I, I guess you have to listen to your customers. Your customers are your CEOs, and the CEO is basically saying, we need people with better skill sets. We need the universities to provide us with those skill sets. And then we need visas to be able to bring in foreigners. And somehow there's a message here. What is it that the foreigners have 
that the universities aren't teaching? And are there any lessons there? I just, it just this whole presentation just seems to be convoluted, and just like the comment that was mentioned earlier. It's almost like internal messages flying back and forth that, that are contradictory, and perhaps we can learn from that. So. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. Um, I think I'll take the picking winners one. Um, I think policymakers are always worried about picking winners, and I think they should be worried about picking winners. But in this case, by highlighting the firms whose customers are picking them over and over and over, year in and year out, the customers are the arbiter of taste here. And the reason to identify scale-ups is because that it, it allows you to see those, pr those companies that might need a little bit of extra help so that they don't sell out early and so that they don't go bust because the right help wasn't offered to them at the right time. So it's not picking winners. It's, it's really just monitoring. Um, monitoring. Uh, you can almost think of it like a diagnosis uh, of, of a patient. It allows you to spot someone who might need some help and to give them the, the right help at the right time. Yeah. Uh, j j just to add to Sherry's point, um, there's quite a lot of evidence of winners picking themselves. So if you speak to Dan Eisenberg, he he'll say, you know, the self-selection uh, part of this is critical. Uh, and so a lot of winners step forward, uh, and by definition, they, they want to win. Uh, there's a trick here, and that trick is to try and make sure that success is publicised, and it's probably something that we can improve here in the UK. Uh, and, and by promoting that success, what Dan feels is that you'll, you'll see role model effects. People don't know what they want until they see it themselves, and so it's not just about picking firms. Firms will pick themselves, but if it's... If it's if the success uh, is celebrated, it's likely to breed more and more successful firms. It's a virtuous cycle. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yes, a lot of cities uh, don't have the finances, whether there's recession in their countries or, or else there just aren't the funds available. Um, I absolutely believe this is still a way of creating economic growth. I think the figures show that, and I think Sherry emphasized these. This is not... Um, a quest for funds. These initiatives don't take more money, in, but they do contribute to the economy. And um, if we think about the types of interventions we're talking about, the monitoring and identifying those who have some kind of issue, the mentorship and the role modeling, the helping find customers, that's just linking up um, the right, uh, the, the customer base with the companies who, who can cater to it, um, making sure the talent is in the right place, upgrading skills with changing the education programs in a particular country. All these interventions, if you have the right people working together, don't necessarily, they're not gonna take more from the economy, but they are gonna contribute. So I, I really do think that, um, that this kind of scale up ecosystem and the type of initiatives that we're talking about really cr do, do contribute to, to economic growth rather than take from it. Just one very brief comment on winners and picking winners, or presumably picking losers is the, the opposite. I mean, a generation or two ago, a lot of industrial policy was about uh, identifying a very small number of champions, national champions, usually very large companies, and directing most support to them. And it's still the case, a high proportion of industrial policy support in this country or the US goes to a, quite a small number of very big uh, incumbent firms. The opposite approach was then to say, be absolutely blind to individual companies and just create the underlying market conditions for, for competition. I think the shift which is happening now, or has been happening for a few years, which Sherry's report is part of, is saying actually it's probably more sensible not just have a completely sort of neutral approach, but to target winners, but to target winners which can demonstrate <coughs> objectively they are growing fast and have high growth potential. Not to reward, as it were, just the existing incumbents, but nor to do nothing. And when you do that, when you target the number of high growth firms within each area, you quite quickly find out there are very specific things they need in order to grow. And what this is in part about is a conversation which quickly gets to very concrete specifics, which may be about uh, building or planning or, 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 or accessing skills and having institutions like LEPS and others with the speed and agility to respond to very specific needs. Now, I, that is still focusing on winners, not losers. And I don't think we should be ashamed of that, but it's very different from you know, early 70s industrial policy. I just, oh, oh, the last point on the winners, winners point. Um, we've just finished having the Olympics a couple of years ago. 
And there we got some amazing world-class global coaches to help the people who had raw talent and the determination to win the Olympics. And I think giving people who have the raw talent and the ambition uh, a bit of extra help so that they understand the, the things they need to do to be, be world class um, is, 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 is the right, right way to go if you want to get winners on a global scale. Um, over to your, and it's not unrelated to your, um, your visa, your visa point or what is it that these foreigners have. Um, if you look at, the Kaufman Foundation did a study on the productivity of someone who has scaled up a firm previously from, uh, again, from 50 employees to 1,000 employees, and their ability to understand and react is something like 22 times a person who has never scaled up a firm or has come from a static firm. So it's like getting somebody who's been an Olympic oarsman into your boat because they will coach every single one of your employees and help them understand how to, uh, how to develop, how to enter other countries, et cetera. The things that these companies claim are holding them back is that they can't find people to help them accept and process lots of customer orders, which they have already. Um, you can't just hire raw talent. If you add in an absence of raw talent and an absence of leadership capability, then, then you get comp companies leaving early and not growing to their full potential. So uh, demonstrably, we know we have less people who have scaled up companies to global size scale here. It's just a mathematics issue. Um, if they exist in other countries and they're willing to come here, then we should make it easy to come here because they will teach every single employee in that company what they need to do. They, as they grow that company, will then be able to teach others in the UK and you'll get the network effect working, working beautifully. That if you don't have them here, then the examples and the role models is you'll see company after company after company sell out too early and fail. Um, and we wanna m make sure that the leaders here get some of the help and some colleagues that can help them along the way. You know, I'm looking at David Cleveley over there. He's scaled probably 30, 40 countries. There's not enough of him to go around in this country. It would be really great if we could import a few who are willing to come here and, and help, and that's all it's doing. The Canadian visa that the recommendation is fashioned after is a temporary one for two years. They come in, they teach, and then they can go. Um, but they teach, and it's helping solve a critical issue. We send care packages to countries to other countries, our experts to other countries to help them out in their hour of need. It's not very different from that. Jeanne Leroux, um, also a freelance consultant um, for startups actually. Um, on people management, so we all know about the talent skills is missing and there is a big gap in the market. Um, now, coming back from to the journalist, um, my view of it is actually potentially there is the need to review the education you have in England concerning your primary and secondary school and how you deal with it, knowing what the other continental Europe ways of so educating. No, I'm going to ask how you're going to deal with it being in the LSE person in charge. <laughs> um, so in that sense, I mean, we see what the other continental Europe, um, higher education does it. So you, as the LSE person in charge, how do you expect that to be changing and how does it evolve the LSE entrepreneurship and things like this related to it? Um, Anthony Mason from the Intergenerational Foundation. Um, we've heard um, a, a lot about um, growth uh, and, and scale-ups, and I'm kind of also very interested in sustainability. Uh, Sherry mentioned um, uh, generating growth for the benefit of our children and our grandchildren, and I wonder whether the report had looked at the, the sort of key factors or identified the key factors that can embed sustainability um, with these fast-growing companies? Uh, 
David Cleveley, Centre for Science and Policy, University of Cambridge. Um, Jeff, you talked about being local and specific. Tamara, you mentioned the idea of um, particular areas. And Sherry, you, you mentioned rather intriguingly the idea that systems of entrepreneurship were actually local in the way that that works. Um, what, in the view of the panel, is the best size for a cluster that will promote scale-ups? <laughs> okay. Um, right, so I, I think she directed the, the first question was directed at you, so I'm going to yeah. let you take them. <laughs> 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 well, the, the answer to that question is we only just started the entrepreneurship of the LSU. We're building on the wonderful basis of 1,200 students in the Entrepreneurship Society, and my colleague Albert Marley and Sarah Eskin and Huggery putting together a splendid range of uh, talks, events, and so forth. We also have uh, the career service with Jane Phillips, who is doing absolutely splendid work with a uh, whole variety of training exercises and this, that, and the other. We set up a, an incubator. So we're just starting on a very interesting, and I hope it will be an ambitious and successful program. Maybe next year, if we have another of these events, I'll be able to say what the results have been. Um, I just, on the role, I, I think I would point to role models as that answer. Um, the Founders for Schools have put role models into schools, primary schools, secondary schools, and examined several months later what the impact was. And uh, seven months later, three times the percentage of kids are choosing STEM subjects. So it uh, lets them understand a, a subject comes to light. They suddenly see why it might be interesting to study physics or maths. Uh, and they might not be getting that in the classroom environment. So role models have a huge effect. Uh, Andy alluded to it earlier. I think we probably all, all have. Even just getting a bunch, get more entrepreneurs in, not only at university level, it's almost a sustainability question. Getting it down to primary level will make them think that this might be something that they would be well suited to, to do. Now, optimum science. Well, first of all, just one comment on schools. I, I have to put a plug in for studio schools, which I, I think are long run exactly the answer we need here. If you're not aware of them, their pupils, teenagers, are doing real life projects with real life firms, big firms in sectors like space, uh, games, construction, from 14 onwards, working on real projects at the core of their curriculum, not as an add on. And I think we need much more of that in, in secondary schools right across. And we do now have five-year-olds doing coding. Estonia did lead the way, but the UK is, is doing quite a lot. On, on scale, um, there is a, a sort of fascinating attempt at a social science of scale of social phenomena like economic clusters. I think what's surprising is, as it, is, is in many fields we find there isn't an optimum scale. So Reykjavik in Iceland, for example, in some ways is quite a dynamic cluster now with, I think, about 100,000 people. Tallinn is about what, half a million in a country of not much more than a million. Um, Singapore, five million. What's much more important is your connectivity to things beyond the cluster, sources of capital, stock markets, sources of expertise, global companies. And you need, in some ways, a mix of a sense of geographical scale, but it's the network structure of your connections is more important. And that's why you don't know there aren't scale effects as you might have expected in the classic uh, clusters of the late 19th century or the 1930s. I couldn't put it better myself. Local connectivity, but also national and international links as well. That's what you need. Now, I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, uh, speakers have an engagement, and they've got to leave by about 7.25. Uh, we could have gone on with questions, I'm sure, for some time, but I hope we will uh, be inviting them back to hear how the manifesto uh, develops. So I would like to thank uh, Sherry Kortu, uh, Tamara Raja, Andy Tom, and Jeff Mulgan for such an interesting evening's presentation on this manifesto. Uh, will you join me in the <laughs>